Chapter 8 of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 8 A Traitor Strikes. Do not move, not one inch. Kamuka repeated that warning as the snake's long body slid slowly past. Whether or not the creature was in search of other prey, to move would be to attract it. Biff realized that from Kamuka's tone as well as his words. Gradually the sliding coil slackened speed. It was Biff who spoke now, his own voice strained, but low. It's turning now, Kamuka. It may be coming back. Maybe, but stay still. One move, you are gone. Despite himself, Biff raised his head, only slightly, but enough to look beyond the long hose-like body that was still gliding by. Aloud, Biff groaned. There is Louise, coming straight toward us. Biff threw up his arms to ward off the great boa's tail as it lashed past. Looking up, he saw the snake's huge mouth yawning toward him. Biff shut his eyes, thinking there was no hope now. Then a wild scream came from just ahead. Biff and Kamuka bobbed up from the grass and saw what had happened. The anaconda on the road for prey had lashed out for the first moving thing that approached it, Louise. Caught in the snake's coils, the guide was shouting, Arubu, a judo, a judo. Arubu took one quick look around and relayed the call for help. Serbot and Pepito came from the tent saw what was happening, and dashed back for their guns. Biff didn't wait to watch what followed. He grabbed Kamuka's arm and exclaimed, Let's go! They went. Behind them, they heard a burst of gunfire. Those first shots must have wounded the anaconda, or frightened it away, for the next volley whistled through the foliage as Biff and Kamuka dived into the jungle. The boys found their path and raced along it until the shooting dwindled far behind them. Breathless, they slackened their pace to a walk and talked over what had happened. In a worried tone, Biff said, They must have seen us, or they wouldn't have fired after us. I hope they didn't know who we were. More likely, observed Kamuka seriously, I think they don't know what we were. You mean they mistook us for some jungle animals? Why not? We were gone quick. Poof! Maybe we were gone quicker than Securia. By Securia, Kamuku meant the anaconda. He was referring to the giant water boa by its more popular Brazilian name. Kamuka's comment brought a smile from Biff. I wonder if they shot the anaconda, he speculated, or whether it managed to get away. Perhaps Luis will tell us, rejoined Kamuka, grinning, when he gets back to our camp. If Luis ever gets back there at all. The boys lost no time in getting back to camp themselves. There they told Mr. Brewster and Mr. Whitman all that had happened. Serbot must have learned a lot from somebody down in Minas Gerais, decided Mr. Brewster, though how I can't quite understand. I checked everyone who had talked with Lou Kirby, and I felt sure he had confided in me alone. And how did Serbot hear about Joe Nara? queried Mr. Whitman. There have been rumours of headhunters and abandoned rubber plantations off in the jungle. But no talk of prospectors and gold mines, at least none that reached me. There were rumours farther up the river, Biff's father said, according to what Nara told us. When Joe bought that cruiser and came down to Manaus, he turned rumour into fact. Nara found out about us, how Whitman pointed out, so why shouldn't Serbot find out about Nara? or about us, for that matter. We know now where the leak came, through Yorubu. Mr. Brewster weighed that statement, then slowly shook his head. Arubu couldn't have sent word to Serbot that fast, he declared. Then, turning to Biff, he queried, You are sure Serbot told Louis to find out what he could about Nara? Yes, replied Biff, and about the map, too. Then it wasn't Serbot's man who stole the map mused Mr. Brewster, unless he wants that missing corner that I still have. 
or else mr brewster interrupted himself as sounds of excitement came from the bearers who were busy thatching palm leaves to form a shelter their babble of dialect included the name Luiz, and a couple of the bearers were running to help the guide as he came limping into camp say nothing warned mr brewster just listen to what Luiz has to tell us Luis had plenty to tell when they formed a sympathetic group around him. I look for Waterhole, Luis told them, and I meet Una Grande Securia, one big anaconda. He grabbed me round my body like this. Graphically, Luis gestured to indicate how the snake's coiled had encircled his body. Biff and Kamuka kept straight solemn faces as Luis continued. I pull my gun quick. Louise thrust his hand deep in his trouser pocket and brought out a small revolver. I fire quick until the gun is empty. He clicked the trigger repeatedly, then broke open the revolver and showed its empty chambers. Still, Anaconda hold me until I draw the knife and stab him hard. From a sheath at the back of his belt, Louise whipped out a knife that looked far more formidable than his puny gun. He gave fierce stabs at the imaginary anaconda, his face gleaming with an ugly smile that was more vicious than triumphant. Louis looked like a small edition of Yorubu, whose ways he seemed to copy. Big snake go off into jungle, added Louis, wiggling his hand ahead of him to indicate the anaconda's writhing course. Hurt bad, I think. Maybe it is dead by now but the animals were still afraid of it. I hear them run. His sharp eyes darted from Biff to Kamuka, but neither boy changed expression. Clumsily, Louis pocketed the revolver with his left hand and thrust the knife smoothly back into its sheath with his right. He rubbed his side painfully, then beckoned to two of the natives and said, We go look for water hole again. A short while later the boys had a chance to exchange comments while they were gathering palm fronds for the shelter. After making sure that no one else was nearby, Kamuka confided, Louis had no gun at start of safari. Arubu must have given gun to him. To explain the shots if any of our party heard them, exclaimed Biff. And did you see the way Louis looked at us when he mentioned scared animals? Maybe they glimpsed us going into the brush. Maybe, agreed Kamuka. I think they shoot Anaconda, or Big Securia would not let Louis go so easy. That's another reason why Louis claimed he shot it, added Biff. We might come across the Anaconda and find the bullet marks. Shortly afterward, the boys found a chance to repeat those opinions to Mr. Brewster, who added a few points that they had overlooked. Louis couldn't possibly have brought the gun from his pocket, as he claimed, stated Mr. Brewster, because the snake was already coiled about his body. For that matter, he could not have drawn his knife either. However, from the clumsy way he showed us his gun and put it back in the wrong pocket, you could tell he had never handled it before. In contrast, he was smooth and quick with his knife, which is obviously his customary weapon. One question still perplexed Biff. That other cam is a good way off, Dad, Biff said. Yet we heard the anvil strokes before we started out. How come you didn't hear the gunfire later? Arubu may have made the first strokes closer by, replied Mr. Brewster. The anvil sound is also sharper than a gunshot and should carry farther. That is probably why they chose it as a signal. Kamuka did well to detect it. That evening, Biff was glad there had been time to build the thatched shelter for a tropical dew had begun to settle, almost as thick as a dripping rain. It was less damp beneath the shelter where Biff and Kamuka had slung their hammocks. Mr. Brewster, however, had inflated a rubber mattress and had placed it near the fire, stating that he would use a poncho to keep off the moisture. From his hammock, Biff watched his dad arrange small logs and palm stalks as spare fuel, as he closed his eyes, Biff could hear his father talking to Louise, who was standing close by. "'I will watch the fire tonight,' announced Mr. Brewster. "'You have been hurt. You need rest more than I do.' "'But, Senor,' objected Louise, "'suppose you fall asleep.' 
I am sure to wake up at intervals. I always do. But you must get some sleep, Louis. You need to guide us to Piedra del Cruchay. You are sure you know the way? Most certainly, Senor. But it may take longer than you expect. A pause. Then Mr. Brewster asked bluntly, Why? "'Because the shortest way is not the best way,' returned Louis. "'We might meet floods or streams where the piranha may attack us. "'They are very dangerous fish, the piranha.' "'I know,' interrupted Mr. Brewster impatiently, "'but we have no time to waste. "'You are meeting someone at Piedra del Cruchay?' "'Yes,' replied Mr. Brewster. "'A man named—' he caught himself, then said in a blunt tone, I won't know our plans until we get there. We will continue on up the river. That is all I can tell you. Don't you have a map, Senor? Biff opened his eyes at Louis's question. He saw his father start to reach into his inside pocket, then bring his hand out empty. Shaking his head, Mr. Brewster said, No, I have no map. Go get some sleep, Louis. You will need it. Biff glimpsed Louis's face as the sneaky guide turned from the firelight. Beneath the hat brim, Louis wore that same ugly smile that showed his satisfaction. Obviously, Louis was planning his next move, probably for tomorrow. When it came, his father would be ready for it, Biff felt sure. Soon Biff drifted into a fitful sleep from which he awoke at intervals. Sometimes he heard the crackle of the fire and decided that his father must have thrown on a log and then gone back to sleep. For, each time, Biff saw the figure of Mr. Brewster covered by the rubber poncho near the pile of logs that had become much smaller during the night. It must have been the fourth or fifth awakening when Biff saw someone move into the firelight's flicker. It was Louis. He crept forward. Crouched above the quiet form, Louis thrust his hand downward as if to reach into the sleeper's pocket. The figure under the poncho seemed to stir. Louis recoiled quickly and sped his hand to his hip. Before Biff could shout a warning, Louis had whipped out his long knife into sight and driven it straight down at the helpless shape beneath him. End of chapter 8